Okay, hello. Um, if you're starting to join us, I'm gonna um, let a, allow a couple minutes here while people join in, or just a minute or so while people join into our Zoom. And I will, while people are doing that, um, welcome to the Elker Village Public Libraries. Our program tonight is making the most of social security with Mike Heatwell from the Dalla Group. Before we start with him, I just wanna make a couple of, um, or a announcement, a couple of announcements. Um, I'm gonna share, right now you should be seeing my Money Smart Meetup screen. I'm gonna share a new screen with you. This is um, a program that, I just heard about today, came in my email. I follow CNBC's um, Money 101 um, information. Uh, and they shared this event that's coming up on November 17th that you might be interested in if you're looking for something money related and interesting to watch. It's called um, Path Forward Your Money. And it's like kind of an online online conference kind of thing. So it's got a bunch of speakers, Susie Orman and um, Brandon Copeland, who's a football player who's involved in money things, um, some authors of, of books, the budget budgetista who you might've seen on face, Facebook following her or anything. So anyway, it's just kind of like an online seminar with um, programs uh, online from about two o'clock to four o'clock. Um, just if you're looking for something to do, I will send out a link for this or put a link in our chat and um, you can just RSVP, um, you provide your name and your email information. Um, you might, you can look into it further, but it is hosted by CNBC. So I feel like it's, you know, a trustworthy source and just maybe some interesting topics. I know they do talk about like the psychology of saving and spending. And Susie Orman talks about money survival strategies. So things that you should be doing right now during this uh, coronavirus time. So there's some interesting topics that are gonna be discussed. Okay, so then enough of that. And I did send out an email um, today um, regarding um, upcoming Money Smart Programming, which we will have, um, another Money Smart program next week, uh, next Thursday evening, if you'd like to join in on that. We're just gonna be talking about holidays on a budget. And then um, we will we'll take off the month of December and then starting in January, we'll do a four part series, January, February, March, and April. So if you'd like information about that, um, you can reach out to me and I'll put my email address in the um, chat feature in a minute. If you haven't gotten any information about that for me and you would like to know, um, I will email you what I have. And so, but now tonight we are, let me stop sharing this one screen, hold on. Um, right now um, we are here with Mike Heatwell. And so I'm gonna turn it over to him now to um, introduce himself. We've had Mike here a couple times a year for many years. I don't know how many years, but um, we keep having him back again because he's um, always great to talk about this topic. Um, obviously he's passionate about it and he's like, um, provides really great, clear information that I'm sure you're all gonna be happy that you're listening in on tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Nancy. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen so everyone can see the presentation here. So let me just pull that up. Are you able to see that? Yes. You can see, you can see it? Okay, very good. All right. So uh, my name is Mike Heatwall, and I'm a financial planner, certified financial planner in Hoffman Estates. Uh, the name of my company is The Dollar Group, and I focus mostly on retirees. So about 80% of my practice is uh, people who are within five years of retirement or already in retirement. Um, right now, I have roughly 140 households or so that I work with. And um, tonight, we're going to be speaking about Social Security. So there's a lot that we're going to cover. I'm going to dive in quickly here. But before I do, I do want to introduce you to my family so that you know who I am and why I do what I do. So um, first is, uh, is Linnea, my wife. Uh, we've been together for 19 years now and uh, been married for 13 uh, this year. 
And um, my my two daughters are the middle one right there in the, the middle is Audrey. So she's our newest addition. Um, she's now seven months old and was born in April, uh, April 16th, actually. So um, she is learning how to crawl currently. And um, she's actually also trying to learn how to walk. She's taking steps now with uh, holding on to daddy's hands. Um, and then she's also trying to eat some solid food. So those are her milestones these days. And um, up in the top left, you can see a picture of the two girls playing with each other. And so Elin is our four and a half year old. Um, so Elin is learning how to read. Um, so she gets really excited about what new letters she's learned when she comes home. And then she's also learning how to swim. So um, she takes some swim classes and she's made it to the second swim class now. Um, so she doesn't have to wear the floaties or the backpack anymore. Now she can swim with her face underwater. Um, so she's very excited about that. And then the uh, bottom uh, left-hand picture is myself, my wife, Linnea, and her father, Lester. And the reason we put that up there is that uh, Linnea and I met in high school. I was going into my senior year. Linnea was going into her junior year. And at that time, she lived with her father. She was the only one living in the household. Her mom had died earlier of breast cancer. And so when I met her, um, you know, Lester was running out of money. He had, uh, he had sold some apartment buildings previously, um, was starting to run out of money due to his uh, multiple strokes that he had over uh, many years. And so um, when, when we um, decided to move in and be his caregivers, um, we did that for all of college. So for four years, we were caregivers to him. Um, you know, multiple times he, he was falling and we had to have paramedics come out. And so, you know, we were going to school and coming back and trying to take care of him. And it was a lot. Um, and so after four years of that, he just needed too much care and we couldn't provide that care anymore. And so at that point, that's, that's when, you know, he was moved into a facility. And so that's the facility, that's a picture at the facility. So um, all of that to say is that the reason why I do what I do and I love financial planning is because um, I like to work with families on setting up those plans ahead of time before something happens to make sure that the family knows what to do um, when that happens and what that individual's wishes are. So, um, you know, we can't necessarily prevent a stroke or other long-term care issues from happening, but we can at least make sure that there's a plan in place for when that does. So um, that's just a little bit about me. And then we're gonna jump right into social security because I know that's what you're here for tonight. So, um, I, um, yes. Can I mention something really quick? I forgot to say at the beginning and I typed it in the chat feature, but if you have questions for Mike along the way, you can use the Q&A feature. You should see that down on, if you're not familiar, you should be able to see that down on your toolbar below Q&A, or you could use the chat too, right? But pre preferably the Q&A and yeah. Mike will see those questions and be sure to answer your questions. Yeah, so what, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Nancy. So what I'm gonna plan on doing is I'll stop every 10 minutes or so and take a look to see if there's any questions in that Q&A section. Um, so I'll stop where it makes sense to after each kind of main section throughout the presentation. So um, yeah, again, it's at the bottom of the screen, you just move your mouse down and it'll pop up that little bar at the bottom and you hit on uh, Q&A. So, all right, so um, Social Security's Outlook, the reason I put this slide up here first before we go into anything else is that we really need to address whether Social Security will be around in retirement. Um, if it's not going to be the rest of the presentation about how to maximize your benefits or be the you know be efficient with your your benefit strategies is completely worthless, right? So um, what we know from Social Security currently is that on your benefit statements it tells you in 2035 the Social Security trust fund will be fully depleted, and what that means it doesn't mean that your benefit will go away fully. But what it does mean is that they're estimating a 20% benefit cut across the board on all retirees by 2035. And so the reason for that is that currently there is a, a deficit between the money that's coming in in Social Security taxes and the money that's going out in Social Security benefits. And so that gap is being picked up by the, the fund, right? So the Social Security fund that's there is filling that gap currently. And so as they continue to, to deplete that, um, we get to a place in, in the future, 2035 is what they're estimating right now, in which we don't have money to draw from anymore. And so the taxes coming in have to match the benefits going out, which is why they are estimating the 20% benefit cut. Now, the somewhat silver lining that I can talk about here is that I've been doing these seminars for eight years now. When I started, the benefit cut was estimated to be 27%. 
and um, the time frame was by 2031, they were estimating a 27% benefit cut. So now it's 20% by 2035. So we're moving in the right direction on both of those numbers. Hopefully that continues to get pushed down the road. Um, but it is something to keep in mind when you're making your social security filing decisions. So um, uh, from there, what I, what I wanna do here is I wanna talk about the basics of social security uh, before we get into some of the other filing strategies because that'll make sure that we're all on the same page and we know what to look for. Um, before I do that, I have one more slide on the, the, um, the system in general as to why we're having an issue or one of the reasons we're having an issue is that back in 1950, we had 16 and a half people paying into the social security system for every one that was collecting benefits. In 2020, that number is now 2.8, and it's projected to be 2.3 by 2035. So you can see that's one of the reasons that we're having a, an, an issue with, in terms of the financial system um, through Social Security. Now, the basics on Social Security are, are pretty straightforward, but we need to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So the four different bullet points here talk about the, the ways that you can qualify for a retirement Social Security benefit. The first one is the one we're gonna cover most here. And then the other three, I have uh, slides later on in the presentation that will dive into the actual details and the rules around those areas. So for the first one, which is how you qualify off of your own earnings, a worker has to have 40 credits to qualify for benefits. Now to earn a credit in today's dollars, you have to earn $1,410 at some point during 2020. Once you've earned that amount, you get your one credit. If you earn four times that amount, so in this case, it would be roughly $5,600 a year, you would get your full four credits. You can't earn more than four in a year. So having 40 is the equivalent of having paid into the social security system uh, at you know for 10 years at some point during your career. That being said, once you qualify, now the actual benefit amount is going to be based on your top 35 years of earnings. Okay, so keep that in mind in terms of how they calculate it. So at the top 35 years of earnings, you really have two different uh, situations that you could fall into. One is you have 35 or more uh, years of earnings. And then the other is that you have less. So for the, for the individual who has more than 35 years of earnings, what they do is they take the top 35 and ignore the rest, right? So every time you make more now, for instance, in 2020, let's say you're making more now than you did in the first of those 35 years earlier in your career, they will replace that lower number with the higher number and recalculate your benefit. Now, what is not commonly known is that that's actually true even after you have filed for social security benefits. So I have some clients that have already taken social security benefits but are still working full time because they enjoy it. Um, you know, they, they wanna get out of the house. And so at that point, what you end up with is that since they're making more now than they did in the first of those 35 years, even though they filed, their benefit continues to be recalculated each year and they get a higher benefit amount um, based off of those earnings if, if it does indeed replace one of those bottom 35. So it's just something to keep in mind if you already have 35 years of earnings. For those of you who don't, let's say you have 20 years of earnings during your career, um, they are including the 15 zeros then in the equation when they calculate that those benefit estimates. So every year that you work, even if it's part-time, it will replace one of those zeros and help you increase that social security benefit. So those are a couple of ways you can, you can increase it. Now, the other three bullet points, you can also qualify, even if you've never um, worked and paid into social security, um, you can still qualify as the spouse of someone who qualifies. You can qualify as an ex-spouse um, or as a surviving spouse. And so again, I'm gonna get into the details of those, those last three later on, um, but it's just something to be aware of here. Now we're gonna talk about social security benefit statements. So many of you have received these in the mail, but if you have not, you'll go to ssa.gov. That's the um, Social Security Administration's website. And when you go there, you're gonna click on the sign in, sign up button up on the top right hand uh, corner. And then uh, you'll scroll down a little bit. And on the left hand side, there's a My Social Security button that you'll click on. When you get there, you'll see the register if you've never been on there before. And so you can put in your personal information and it's going to give you some um, questions from your credit file, your credit history. So um, just be careful that you pay attention to what they're asking. Some of the questions can be a little tricky. So for instance, they may, might ask, you know, which of these five banks did you refinance your primary mortgage with in 2015? And so they might have the bank that you refinanced with, but they might also have the bank that's uh, purchased it since then and is now servicing it. 
So if they ask for which one did you refinance with, you need to select the one that you refinanced with back in 2015, not who's servicing it now. So it's just an example of paying attention to the question they're asking, making sure that you're, you're not overlooking that by flying through it. So once you get through the system, you will be able to pull up your benefit statement. You can view or print that as a PDF and um, you'll see a four page document. So the first and the fourth page, uh, there's not a lot of information that we need to review. It's really the second and the third page that have the majority of the information. So that's what we're gonna discuss tonight. So um, on page two, this is what page two looks like. What I've done here is I've blown up, I've taken just the top half of page two. The bottom half is, is text, so it's not um, any type of estimate um, that would be applied to you. And then page three is your earnings history. And so we're gonna look at page two and three here. So page two, what you're gonna see is at the top of the page, you always have three line items. You've got your full retirement age estimated benefit, you've got your age 70 estimated benefit, and then you've got your age 62 estimated benefit. So the, the important thing to understand here is that the top number, your full retirement age benefit, is the benefit that's calculated off of those top 35 years of earnings. The age 70 benefit is just taking that full retirement age benefit that's been calculated already, and it's giving you an 8% credit every year that you wait from full retirement age to age 70. Okay, you don't want to wait past age 70. It doesn't, it doesn't grow any further past age 70. So age 70 is the last time or the last um, age that you would want to wait until. Now, for the age 62 benefit, again, it's just pulling from that 1851 number, that full retirement age number, but now it's giving you a reduction for taking it early. That reduction is roughly 6% a year. So again, the reduction is a roughly 6% a year. The increase is roughly 8% a year after full retirement age. So, so you can kind of get an idea in terms of how much you would, you would see in terms of reduction um, if you took it at 64, for instance. So it's just something to keep in mind as you, you look at those. Now, the, the other piece here is that those estimated benefits are based off of an assumption that Social Security Administration is making. So we need to make sure that that assumption is actually correct based on your financial picture. That assumption is found halfway down on the second page, where on, on our slide, it's actually at the bottom, but um, you'll see we base your benefit estimates on these facts. That's in bold down at the bottom. And then that second bullet point says your estimated taxable earnings after 2020 is $46,770. That is the assumption that they are making is that you will continue to make $46,770 between now and full retirement age. So when you look at your benefit statement, that number will be whatever was last reported to Social Security. So for this individual, that 46,770, that's likely what they made in 2019. And that's why they're making the assumption that they will continue to make that moving forward. So for you, the reason why that's so important is that that's what those benefit estimates are based off of. So if you're actually planning on retiring, let's say at 62, but not take your social security benefit until full retirement age at 67, let's say, um, you actually will have five years of zeros in those benefit estimates instead of the 46,770 that they were assuming. Now, if you already had 35 years of earnings, it'll likely reduce that, it'll reduce your estimated benefits a little bit less than if you didn't. And what I mean by that is that for someone who has 35 years of earnings, um, that 46,770 is likely replacing one of those lower earnings, you know, over those five, that five year period. And so it will um, decrease your benefit estimate if you have zeros there instead, right? Now, for someone who doesn't have a full 35 years of earnings, what they're going to end up with is that Social Security was assuming that 46,000 was going to replace a zero in their, in their equation, right? Because they have 15 zeros, for instance. And so that's going to hurt them even more uh, when you have those zeros in there versus, you know, even a low number for someone who has 35 years of earnings. So hopefully you followed along with me there. Um, I try and keep it as simple as possible, but it's important that you understand that assumption that's being made. If that assumption is incorrect, you can go on ssa.gov and there's an online calculator that you can use where you plug in your earnings and then you can actually tell the, the calculator uh, how much you plan on making after 2021, right? And so you can put it in there and say, well, I'm actually gonna be retiring next year. So it's gonna be zero and you can recalculate it and it'll give you those new benefit estimates so that you can have a better snapshot of what retirement's actually going to look like. So um, hopefully that made sense there. Um, the other two pieces, disability and survivor benefits. So disability I'll cover quickly here, survivor benefits I'm gonna cover later. So for disability, 
um, if you qualify for social security disability, let's say you're in your 50s, um, something happens, a stroke like my father-in-law, and um, you need to file for disability and you get approved, that number, the 1826 that's shown there is what your monthly payment would be for disability. That would continue until you get to retirement age at your full retirement age. Once you hit full retirement age, that same amount, the 1826 would be, continue to be paid to you. It would not change. Okay, but the only difference is that in the system, it's now a retirement benefit instead of a disability benefit. Okay, so that's the only difference is that once you get to full retirement age, the number stays the same, but it's just treated as a retirement benefit in the system. So um, a disability by itself is really like a two hour presentation. Uh, there's a lot that goes into social security disability. So if that applies to you, um, that's something where you really wanna dig into those rules. Now on the survivor piece, again, I'll talk about that later. Um, notice that on the survivor piece for a spouse, where it says that third bullet point down your spouse who reaches full retirement age, it's 1826 a month. That's very, very close to what the full retirement age benefit is of 1851. So when you're trying to figure out what that survivor benefit would be, it's going to be very similar to that estimated full retirement age benefit. So, all right. I'm going to talk about earnings records. So page three, and then I'll look at uh, Q&A to see if there's any questions that have come in. So again, feel free to type your questions in if you have anything on these first couple slides. So on the earnings record, um, that third page of your benefit statement, it, I've blown this up so that we can see it on the presentation. But what you would actually have is an earnings record that goes all the way back into the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, all the way to today. And it shows each of those years how much you paid into Social Security. And so, or the, the earnings that were um, used for social security taxation. So um, what you wanna look for is any big errors. So uh, here I'm showing in 2011, we have two zeros, right? For uh, social security and Medicare taxation. What that means is that nothing was ever reported to social security. So if you know that you worked all the way through that time period, that means that we've gotta go back to social security administration and get that updated. So uh, what I tell my clients is that it's, it's best if you, take a look at these earnings records every two or three years just to make sure that it's being reported properly. We don't care if it's off by a couple of dollars. We care about those big, you know, big errors like a zero when there's not supposed to be one there. Um, to get those fixed, you you'd have to provide a tax return to Social Security Administration for that year, which is why the earlier you catch it, the better, because, you know, of course, not all of us have uh, tax returns from 1990 um, laying around that we could provide Social Security Administration to prove what those earnings were. So, um, just something to keep in mind there. So before I go on, let me just double check. Okay, we don't have any Q&A that's come through, so I'll keep going. So on social security strategies, we're gonna talk about individual. Uh, so filing as an individual, we'll talk about married couples, we'll talk about divorced and survivor benefits. So we're gonna try and cover the whole, um, the whole spectrum there. So um, for individuals, um, this is really, this graph is only applicable for someone who does not have divorce benefits, does not have spousal benefits, so you're not married, um, someone who is single and, and was not married for at least 10 years. Okay, that's, that's what this graph applies to. And the reason that I put this graph up is it's a really simple representation of we're trying to decide how long does it take to um, make our, our social security decision worth it. And so here's what I mean by that. Um, if I'm an individual and I could take my benefit at 62, that's the earliest I can take it, and it's going to be $1,500 a month, that means that I could collect $18,000 a year from 62 to 66, which is $72,000 total, right? That I could collect in those four years. So if I wait till 66, I wanna know how long does it take for me to make back that $72,000, right? And so if I'm going to get an extra $500 a month, which you can see there as the age 66 is 2000 a month, which is 500 more than at 62, so in that case, that's an extra $6,000 a year that I'm receiving if I wait until 66, which means that if I take 72,000 divided by 6,000, that's 12 years. So it's gonna take me 12 years to go from, you know, to, to basically earn that money back um, in terms of what I could have collected. So from 66 to 78, I will just be earning that money back that I left on the table. Once I get past 78, that's when it benefits me to have waited until 66, because now I'm getting an extra $500 a month for the rest of my life, as long as I live, 
right? So it's just important to know what that age is. Now there's, there's some important things that I'm skipping there. You know, I'm not looking at what happens if you had invested that social security benefit in the meantime or time value of money and that kind of thing. But um, I'm trying to keep it really simple so we can kind of get a grasp around how long do you have to live? So if you wait until 70, you'd really have to live past 82 in order to make that worth it where you start you know, coming out ahead. So again, one of the big unknowns is how long are you going to live? We obviously don't know that. And so one of the things that we go off of is, well, two things that we go off of is longevity in your family and then any medical conditions that you may have already been diagnosed with. So, you know, if you already have a medical condition where it's going to limit your life expectancy, um, then at that point, we might decide to take it earlier versus later. Or if everyone in your family has died in their 60s um, and, and you're kind of, you feel like you're in that same health um, range, then again, we're probably going to take it earlier. Um, so it's, it's just something to think through when you're making that decision. Again, this is mostly for individuals because with couples, you have a survivor benefit that we have to think about as well. So, all right, it looks like we had one, I see something come in on the chat. So let me take a look. Uh, sorry, a bit, okay. If there's time, can you go over the income assumption on page two? Okay. Um, on page two. So that's here. Can I go over the income assumption? Okay. I'm, I'm losing my job at the end of the year and don't plan to get the same income level. Would there be consequences? Okay. So yes, there would be consequences uh, because of that. So what would happen is that social security was assuming that you would earn that income, you know, your current income all the way until full retirement age. But because you are not going to be earning that full income, then your benefit estimate is likely going to come down. So um, if you want to simulate that and kind of understand how much it's going to affect you, you could go on ssa.gov, click on their online retirement calculator, you'll plug in your earnings, and you can actually put in, you know, if you think you're going to be working part-time for, you know, between now and full retirement age, you can put in whatever you want that income to be. And, and it'll recalculate those benefit estimates for you. Um, if that seems like a lot, you're welcome to reach out. I have my contact information at the end and I'm happy to run that for you. Um, but yes, it will affect you um, negatively, um, you know, in, in terms of not having that full income. So, all right. So I'm gonna keep going here. Let me get back to the slide I was at. All right. So we're gonna jump into filing for married couples because there's a couple different strategies that we can, we can look at here. So we've got filing for your own benefits, filing for spousal benefits, and then filing for restricted spousal benefits. Now, I will give you the caveat here of restricted spousal benefits have a major limitation on them currently um, and moving forward. And this was from a 2015 bill that was passed in November of 2015. And so what they did is that they limited only individuals who were born on or before January 1st, 1954, can use the restricted spousal benefits. So if you were born after that date, you can no longer use restricted spousal benefits. So I still do cover it in case there's someone listening that is able to use that strategy. Um, but for many of us, you will not be able to. So then we're, we're left with filing for your own benefits and filing for spousal benefits. So let's talk through that. So we're going to use an example of Tom and Mary, a married couple. Tom is 66, Mary 63. And Tom's full retirement age benefit is $2,500. And then uh, Mary's full retirement age benefit is $1,200. So the only reason there would be that much of a gap between the two is that either Tom made that much more during his lifetime or Mary didn't work a full 35 years during her career. Now, the strategies that I'm going to talk about with the spousal benefits, it works either direction. So it doesn't matter which one is the higher earner here or older or younger. Um, so it's just something to, to keep in mind is that we can flip these and it still works the same way. So in our scenario, Tom at 66 takes his 2,500. So he files for his own benefit at Social Security. He can either do that online or in person. And he collects $2,500 a month. Three years later, Mary goes in, she goes to collect on her own benefits. So again, she files for her own benefit. And what Social Security does is they look at her 1,200 and they compare that to um, a spousal benefit if she's eligible. In this case, she is, and I'm gonna talk about the rules on the next slide here, but because she's eligible, her spousal benefit is actually half of Tom's benefit. So half of 2,500 is 1,250. So because 1,250 is higher than 1,200, Social Security will give her 1,250 a month. So between the two of them, they'll be collecting 3,750 a month moving forward. 
Okay, so let's talk about the rules around spousal eligibility for that spousal benefit. You have four bullet points here. First one being you have to be 62 or older to qualify. That's the case for any social security benefits except for uh, social security retirement benefits, except for survivor benefits. Okay, that's the only one that's different. Now you have to also have been married for at least one year. So no shotgun weddings in Vegas. And then you're collecting spousal benefits the next day. Um, they don't allow that. You have to put, put up with them for at least 12 months um, to get that benefit. But once you've been married for at least a year, you get those spousal benefits if, if you um, choose to take that versus your own. Now, the last two are the most important. Your spouse must first file for social security in order for you to qualify for a spousal benefit. And if claimed, if you take the spousal benefit at your full retirement age, you will get half of their full retirement age benefit, no matter when they took it. Okay. So here's what I mean. We're going to come back here to this slide because it's easier to see it here. So there's two rules that I just talked about. Let's talk about the first one. If Tom waits until 70 in this scenario, instead of taking it at 66, if we take, we have him wait until 70 because we want his to, to grow at 8% a year, right? So it's going to go from 2,500 to 3,300 by age 70. But what'll happen is that when Mary goes to file at 66, Tom hasn't filed yet. So Mary is not eligible for a spousal benefit. So because of that, what she'll get is she'll get the $1,200 that she is due off of her own earnings. And then when Tom files a year later at 70, she'll get the extra $50 spousal increase for the fact that Tom has now filed. Okay, that happens automatically. Now notice that I did not say she gets half of the 3,300 that Tom will be due at age 70. It is always half of the full retirement age benefit. So it is not helping Mary on the spousal side by having Tom wait, okay? Now, the other thing that's important here is that if Tom were to collect early, so let's say he took it at 62 and instead of getting 2,500, he gets 1,700 because of the reduction. As long as Mary waits until her full retirement age, which in this case is 66, she'll still get 1,250 as the spousal benefit, even though Tom took his early. So again, that's what that last bullet point was talking about is it's always half of the spouse's full retirement age benefit as long as Mary waits until her full retirement age to collect it. If Mary tried to collect a spousal benefit prior to full retirement age, then both her spousal benefit and her own benefit will be reduced because she's taking it early and they'll give her whichever one is higher. So in this case, it would be the spousal benefit. So for instance, if she took it at 63 when Tom files, instead of getting 1250 for the spousal benefit, let's say she'll get 900 instead. Okay, and she would stay at that 900 then for the rest of their lives. It does not go back up when she gets the full retirement age. So just keep that in mind in terms of if you're looking at filing early, you will have a reduction on both yours and the spousal benefit and you won't get that back. Okay. All right. Uh, that's what it looks like in the system. So, you know, just quickly what they do is they do split it out for, for Mary in this case, where um, she knows how much is her benefit versus how much is the spousal benefit. Okay, let's talk about restricted application for spousal benefits, and then I'll go to the Q&A to see if there's anything there. Um, so again, that in bold right there, you have to have been born prior to or on January 1st, 1954. If you were not, you cannot use this strategy. Here's what it does. It was a very, very powerful strategy. Um, so if you can still use it, that's wonderful. Uh, but for many, we can't anymore. So um, Tom, again, does the exact same thing. He takes it at, 25, uh, at 66, and he collects 2,500 a month. Mary gets to 66 and she takes her spousal benefit only. Okay. So that's the big difference is instead of collecting, instead of filing for her own benefit and getting the spousal benefit because it's higher, she is filing for only the spousal benefit. So it's called a restricted spousal benefit. And she's letting her benefit continue to grow at 8% a year. So she can actually collect the 1250 a month for the spousal benefit and her $1,200 a month grows from 1200 up to the 1584. And so what she does basically is she turns off the spousal benefit at 70 and turns on her 1584 benefit at age 70. That's what's known as a restricted spousal benefit. So it's a very powerful strategy, again, if you can still use it. All right, let's see anything on Q&A. Nope, all right, so I'll keep going. So um, ex-spousal benefits. So ex-spousal benefits are very similar to the spousal benefits that I already talked about. So a lot of the same rules apply, but there are some additional rules that are here in order for you to qualify. 
So you have to have been married for at least 10 years. You have to be unmarried when you file for benefits, which makes sense because if you're married currently, then your, your benefits are going to be based off of your current spouse, not your ex-spouse. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that it does not matter whether the, your ex-spouse is married or not. Okay, Social Security does not care whether they have remarried. It only matters as to whether you have remarried when you go to file for ex-spousal benefits. And then the middle one is, is important as well because remember with spousal benefits, you're not eligible for spousal benefits until your spouse has filed. So if that were true for ex-spousal benefits, we would have a major issue because many ex-spouses are not communicating with each other. So you will have no idea when your spouse has filed, your ex-spouse has filed. So in that case, what they've done is they've put this rule in that says, as long as you're 62 and as long as your ex-spouse is 62 or older, um, then you are eligible to file for a spousal benefit if you choose to do so, an ex-spousal benefit. So just keep that in mind in terms of the rules that we've talked about with spousal benefits and how that works. In this case, you don't have to wait for your ex-spouse to file. As long as you're both over 62, you can take that ex-spousal benefit when you're ready. Again, if you take it early, it's going to be reduced. So if you want the full ex-spousal benefit, you would wait until full retirement age to get that. And it's your benefit or the ex-spousal benefit, not both. Okay, just like with spousal benefits. So I'll keep going here. Survivor benefits. So uh, survivor benefits are a bit unique. They're a little different than all of the others because what it's doing is it's actually giving you some leeway in terms of when you can collect that benefit. So there's really two main pieces to survivor benefits. The first one is what is the full survivor benefit? And then the other one is when are you going to take that full survivor benefit or when are you gonna take your survivor benefit? So let's talk about the first piece. You really have three different scenarios that could occur. Your spouse is collecting social security and they die at in which point the survivor benefit would be whatever they were collecting. That's the full survivor benefit. So whatever their monthly benefit was, that's what you would get as the survivor. If they had not filed yet, and were past full retirement age, that's the second scenario. So let's say they were waiting until 70, but they died at 68, okay, to take their benefits. Social Security will give you the extra 8% for each year that they had waited. And so in this case, if they died at 68, they would give you their full retirement age benefit plus the 16% increase as well. And that would be the full survivor benefit that would be due to you. Now, the third scenario is that they die prior to full retirement age and they have not collected yet in which case then you would look at their benefit statement in that year of their death and you would see what that survivor benefit is, just like I showed you on that second page where it gives you the survivor benefit for the spouse and or if there's minor children involved, you would also have a survivor benefit there as well. Now, so that's how you figure out the full survivor benefit. So let's call it $2,000 a month in, in our case, okay? So let's say Tom has died, Mary is now eligible for a survivor benefit of $2,000 a month. So now Mary has to make a decision as to when she's going to take that survivor benefit. She can take it as early as age 60, but if she takes it at 60, it's going to be reduced because she's taking it early. So instead of getting 2000, it'll be 1400, okay? So she could do that. She could take $1,400 a month. And in our case, remember that Mary was going to have $1,200 a month off of her own benefit. And so the survivor benefit is still more than that, even if you take it early. So she would just continue to collect her survivor benefit then for the rest of her life at 1400. Now she could also wait until full retirement age to collect that survivor benefit. If she does that, she'll get the full $2,000 a month, at which point then she would get the $2,000 a month and collect that moving forward for the rest of her life. Now here's the one big roadblock that we run into most often with someone who has lost a spouse. So for an individual who's lost a spouse, and let's say they're in their late 50s, and they are getting closer to 60, and in their mind, they're thinking, once I get to 60, I can take my survivor benefit from Social Security, and I can keep working full time so that it supplements, you know, it's a supplemental income for me. What ends up happening is they go into Social Security, they ask to apply for the survivor benefit, Social Security says, how much are you earning this year? And they say $40,000, right, and just making up a number. And so at that point, Social Security says, I'm sorry, you don't qualify for a survivor benefit. And they walk out confused, not knowing why they don't qualify. Now, what they don't tell you is there's an earnings limit that we have to be aware of. So in 2020, the earnings limit is 18,000. Well, let me look up the exact number, $18,240 a year. So for someone who is making significantly over that amount, their benefits, their social security benefits will be reduced all the way down to zero, okay? So for instance, if Mary was making $40,000 a year, 
and she was supposed to get you know $1,400 a month as her survivor benefit at age 60, she'll actually get nothing from social security because it's reduced so much because she's over that cap. She's $22,000 over the cap. So what's important to know here is that the earnings limit is only applicable for individuals prior to full retirement age. Once Mary gets to full retirement age, she could take her survivor benefit, the full $2,000 a month, and work full-time, and there's no restrictions on that, okay? Same thing is true with any Social Security retirement benefits, is once you get to full retirement age, you can make as much as you want to and still collect your full Social Security benefits. But if you're trying to collect early with any of those benefits, you have to be aware of that earnings limit because it applies across the board on all of those Social Security retirement benefits. I'm gonna, I have a slide later on where I'll actually walk you through a quick example of this um, to give you some additional rules on that. So it's just something to keep, keep in mind because that's the, the biggest stumbling block I find with someone who's lost a spouse and wants to supplement their income. The last piece on strategies is if you have a pension, public pension, so these would include teacher retirement system, so TRS, SERS, which is the community college pension system. Um, it includes city pensions where you were not paying into social security, government pensions where you weren't paying into social security during your time there. Um, you have to deal with these windfall elimination provision and government pension offsets. So uh, WEP, WEP, and GPO is what they're more commonly known as. So for instance, on the WEP, what that does is it reduces your social security benefit that you would have been due, right? Based on how much your pension is monthly from that um, public institution. So in 2020, the maximum reduction that they could apply is $470 a month. So if you were supposed to get $1,000 a month off of your earnings, you're going to get instead $530 a month, okay? The GPO um, is a offset or it's a, a reduction on your spousal and survivor benefits. So again, if you have a large public pension, then what they do is they take two thirds of your monthly pension amount and that's how much they subtract off of your survivor benefits and spousal benefits. So for most individuals, that brings it all the way down to zero. So the easier way of saying that is that if you have one of these government pensions or TRS pensions, in most cases, you're gonna have very little to nothing coming for spousal or survivor benefits to you through social security. So just keep that in mind. All right, it looks like we did have a question come in. So let me see what we've got going here. Oh, okay, that was, that was just, okay. Um, that was just the handout. So if you did not get handouts, um, let us know and we will get those emailed out to you immediately. Um, that is the quick reference guide. And then there should have been a brochure in there that just gives you a little bit more background on me and the firm. Um, all right, so back to social security here. So we've got um, two miscellaneous provisions that I want to cover before we move forward um, with the last few items here. So one of them is the retroactive benefit that's available. So if you're in this uh, webinar and you realize you know, wow, I should have already filed based on using one of these strategies, you can actually backdate your application up to six months, okay? And so, you know, that, that may um, happen if, for instance, you could have done restricted spousal benefits and you didn't, or um, you realize that, you know, okay, my longevity actually is, you know, in, you know, all my family members died in their 60s, so maybe I don't want to be waiting and I should have just already taken it. Right. And so in those cases, you can go back in and backdate that and they'll give you a lump sum check for those six months and then apply your payments monthly moving forward. The other one that I don't have a slide for, I call the oops provision. That is a 12 month window that Social Security has where if you have already filed, as long as it's within 12 months of when you filed, you can actually go back, pay back the gross amount that they paid you. So you write them a check and they will act as if you've never filed. You can do that once during your lifetime. So again, that would be used in the opposite case where you've already filed, you're now sitting through this webinar realizing that you shouldn't have filed the way that you did, and you actually wanna wait or you wanna file differently, then you could pull your application, give them the money back, and they will act as if you've never filed. So uh, those are the two miscellaneous provisions there. All right, let's move on here to cost of living adjustment. So for cost of living adjustment, there's a couple of uh, things that I point out here. So notice that they've been a lot lower in the past 10 uh, years or so. It's now going on, I guess, 12 years since 2008. Um, so 2008 obviously was the, the recession. And then 2009 is when interest rates were rock bottom and in, um, 
and inflation was rock bottom. And so for 2009 and 2010, there was no cost of living adjustment for social security. That happened again in 2015. There was no cost of living adjustment again. And you can see in 2020, it's 1.6. And I believe in 2021, if I remember right, it's 1.3. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think it's 1.3 for 2021 based on the latest letters that clients have been receiving. So, um, you know, I'll get that updated here in a month or so, but um, they do apply that automatically. You do not have to do anything to get that cost of living adjustment. It is just you, you receive a letter in November, typically of every year, telling you what that new uh, COLA is for the upcoming year and what your new monthly benefit will be that you're going to be receiving. Now, the other thing that I point out here, notice that 1.6% that's likely not gonna be enough to keep up with inflation of your expenses. So Medicare premiums, for instance, are averaging between six to 8% a year in inflation. Um, and so you know that doesn't keep up with even Medicare inflation, let alone any of your other expenses in retirement. So um, don't count on this. Hopefully you have some other assets that you can um, have growing at a higher rate than what your, your Medicare premium inflation is or your other retirement expenses. So, you know, at least three, 4%, um, in, you know, that you have some investments that are able to do that for you because social security won't be that investment. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind there. All right, so um, let's talk about that earnings limit. I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper here on the earnings piece. So on your quick reference guide on the second page, the top chart on that second page actually has this information listed so that you don't have to copy it down. Um, and so what you wanna pay attention to is that again, once we hit full retirement age, there's no earnings limit anymore. It's only when you're trying to file for a benefit prior to full retirement age that we have to deal with the earnings limits. And so I had mentioned earlier that it's 18,240 is the earning limit. And so what they do is that for every $2 over that cap, that your income is, your earned income, they take $1 off of your social security benefits for the year. So I'm gonna do a quick example for you. So if I'm making $40,000 a year and I file early, I'm gonna round that cap to 18,000 just to keep the numbers easy here. So I'm 22,000 over the cap. So if I'm 22,000 over the cap, they're going to reduce my social security benefits by $11,000 a year. So if I was supposed to get $2,000 a month and I file early, I'm now going to get no benefit in January, February, March, April, May, and half of June. I'm gonna get $1,000 in June, and then I'll start getting my $2,000 a month for the rest of the year. Once it turns January of the next calendar year, that starts all over again. They take their checks first, and then I get my payout after. So for most individuals, if you are significantly over that 18,240 cap, you're not going to file for social security benefits early until you either go to part-time or you retire or you get to full retirement age. Now, the question always comes up. And so it looks like we did have a question that just came in on question and answer. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the question that always comes up and then I'll look to see what was submitted. So um, what typically comes up here is what is counted as earnings, right? So it's important that we, we um, talk about that because the earnings limit is talking about only W-2 income and 1099 contractor income. It does not include IRA, IRA withdrawals, pension income, um, interest, dividends, capital gains. None of that is counted as earned income. So, um, you know, if, if you're just pulling from investment accounts and you have other investments that are, you know, creating capital gains and dividends, none of that's going to count towards this 18,240 limit. It's only earned income. All right. So let's take a look at if that's the question that came in. I'm 78, own a small business and continue to work. I have not received an increase other than COLA for the past four years, even though I continue to pay my portion as well as my business. Should I not be getting an increase? So um, you should be getting an increase if your income, so the salary that you're paying yourself um, and paying social security taxes on is higher than the lowest of the 35 years of your earnings reports. Now, that being said, all of those are adjusted for inflation. So they all have these indexes that you have to multiply those numbers by. So it's not as easy as just taking, you know, if you're paying yourself a $50,000 salary a year, you can't take that and compare it to what you earned in 1980, right? You've got to index everything for inflation and they have those tables on the social security website. Um, but if you've done that and you're seeing that your earnings are higher now, then yes, you should be getting a benefit increase because of those earnings. Um, replacing the bottom 35th of those earnings. So hopefully that helps. Okay, uh, we're gonna keep going. All right, 
So federal taxation of social security benefits. So it's important for us to understand how our social security benefits will be taxed in retirement. And so right now the state of Illinois does not tax social security income. They don't tax any retirement income. So that's IRA withdrawals, pension income, social security income. So we don't have to worry about that side of the equation if you're planning on staying in Illinois, as long as they keep the rules the same. Um, now the federal side, is um, a kind of you know a whole separate entity. So we've got to look at what the IRS says about the federal taxation. So for federal taxation, they use a term called provisional income. So for provisional income, what they do is they take your adjusted gross income for that year, they add municipal bond interest to that, any you know municipal bond, bond interest from your investments, and then they add half of your household social security benefit as well. When they add all of that together, they come up with a number, right? And so if you wanted to know what adjusted gross income is, that's literally all income coming into your house except Roth IRA withdrawals. So this does include IRA withdrawals, pension income, interest, dividends, capital gains, all of that is included in AGI, okay? Once they put all of that together, you have a number. Let's call it $50,000. We then compare that to the table that's on your quick reference guide. It's on page two and it's the bottom table where it says provisional income thresholds. And we compare that to see where we fall. And so I have that, that here up on the screen uh, for, for our use, for our reference at the moment. So here's what we're going to do. Let's say that I married filing jointly and I came up with a provisional income of $50,000. What that means is that if I, I'm on the bottom row where it says married filing jointly, I go all the way to the right and it says above 44,000 puts me in that last category. So because I'm at 50,000, I'm in the last category and I'm going to owe federal tax on my social security benefit. So now, the, now we have to figure out how much tax am I going to owe? So if I have a $2,000 a month benefit, what they do is that they take 15% off of that number. So we're gonna go from 2,000 down to uh, 1,700, okay? Once I'm at 1,700, that is what is added as taxable income on my federal tax return. So $1,700 a month will be taxed based on whatever my federal tax bracket is for that year. So if I'm in the 22% tax bracket, I will pay 22% tax on $1,700 a month. So that comes out to be roughly $360 in federal tax on my social security benefits each month. So again, my benefit is $2,000 a month. So if I owe $360 in federal tax, I'm only going to get $1,640 per month instead of $2,000 per month, okay? So it's really important for you to understand how much federal tax needs to be withheld so that you can take a look at cash flow and project that out to see what that's going to be. Now, there are certain circumstances where your federal, your social security uh, benefit won't be taxed. So if you fall into the left column where you fall under the 32,000 for that provisional income or under 25,000 based on whatever your filing status is, you won't be taxed at all on your social security benefits. Anything between those two numbers is taxed. Um, you know, there's a ratio in terms of how much is taxed. And there's a form that you fill out with the IRS when you do your federal tax return to, to figure that out. So here's what that means is really when I'm looking at this, it presents a planning opportunity for some individuals. And I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of what that is, where you could take this back to your accountant and financial planner to see if there's a way to help make your social security benefit federally tax free. Okay. So in some cases this works in others, it doesn't, it just depends on your financial picture. So here's what this looks like. If I take two couples and they have the exact same living expenses where they both need $67,000 a year, you can see that in bold there where it says total income. The only difference is that couple one's going to take 25,000 out of an IRA, a traditional IRA, and couple two is going to take 25,000 out of a Roth IRA instead. What that does is because the Roth IRA is not included in the provisional income equation, Couple one's provisional income is 56,000. So it puts them all the way in that right-hand column when we come back here to this table, right? For couple two, their provisional income comes in at 31,000, which puts them all the way in the left-hand column where they're underneath that $32,000 limit. So what that ends up with is that couple one basically pays full federal taxation on their social security benefits. 
Couple two pays no federal taxes on their social security benefits for that year, even though they both had the exact same total income coming into the house. Now, this only works prior to required minimum distribution age, which is now 72. And what I mean by that is once you get to 72, when you have money in your IRAs, the IRS forces some of that money out, right, every year based on your life expectancy. And so when they do that, that'll likely then push you over those, those you know, non-taxable limits where now your social security benefit starts to become taxable for the rest of retirement. But potentially for many individuals, let's say you retire at 65, but you don't take your benefit until you know, 70 and you don't take your IRA withdrawals until 72. You know, in those cases, you may have some years in there where you could get your social security benefits tax-free um, federal tax-free while you're still, you know, taking those benefits and you're still living off of the same income. Now, a couple of caveats to this, obviously you have to then, that means you have to have money in a Roth IRA. So if you don't, it might mean that Roth conversions could make sense. Um, you know, in some cases they do based on whatever your tax bracket is now and in others it doesn't. So again, this is where your accountant and your financial planner really need to be working together on this to make sure that they're running the tax projections and giving you some feedback in terms of whether this makes sense for you or not. But if you can get money into a Roth IRA to pull from in those first few years, you could save yourself a lot of money on federal taxes on those social security benefits. So it's just something to keep in mind. All right, let's see, we've got two questions, uh, two Q and A's that came in. Is there a form that I need to file to get the increase I am entitled to related to the question above? I've written twice to social security with no response. Okay, so um, feel free to email me. Let me do a little research on that and, and find out um, how you would go about that and if there's, a, if there's a specific form. I don't know of one off the top of my head because I haven't run into that before, um, but I'm happy to, to help however I can. So feel free to, you know, I'll have my contact info at the end so you can shoot me a, a quick email on that. Um, okay, so how do I help as a financial planner? I've got a couple of things that you can uh, take advantage of. So the free social security resources are on my website. So you can go to the dollargroup.com and you can get to it a couple of different ways. There's a tab on the homepage that you can click on. There's also up at the top, a tab that says events. So you can click on the events and then the social security resources. And you've got five different resources that are up there that can kind of help you understand what you're eligible for. And it also has the quick reference guide that was already emailed to you. Um, then if you want to meet in person, if you want a more in-depth analysis of your actual social security picture and what options make sense for you, what filing strategies make sense for you, we can get together one-on-one -on -one to do that either in person or virtually and go through your benefit statements and I can help answer any questions that you have on social security. So this is what that looks like. The next two slides is the printouts from that, that program that I use. And so really what it is um, to keep it simple is um, you come in, you bring in your benefit statements, let's say you're married, and you say, Mike, I want to know what happens if I file at 70 and my wife files at 66. What happens if I take it at 66 and she takes it at 66? You know, what happens if we both wait till 70? So we start to print these out and we set them next to each other and we look at this and say, okay, which one of these actually makes sense based on the rest of your finances, right? The other assets that you have, the investments you have to live off of in the meantime, if you're not gonna take social security right away, right? And we talk through that whole picture to give you a, a good understanding as to which strategy likely makes sense moving forward. So that's what we would do together if you wanna do that um, and, and do that one-on-one -on -one piece. If you wanna do that, you would send your information to me. You can just email your info over to me um, with a way to get back a uh, hold of you. So a phone number, and then I'll have your email address and we'll schedule an appointment to either get together in person or virtually. Um, what I do with these presentations, I don't charge anything for that appointment. I realize that I end up doing a lot of free work because of that, but um, the reason it works for me is that I know that you know out of every five people that come in and, and um, want social security help, one of those will become a client over the long term. And so um, for you, I'm, I'm happy to help you, even if you've already got a planner you've worked with for 10, 15 years and you're comfortable with them, you're not looking for a second opinion, that's fine. I'm still happy to help you answer questions. Um, if you do want a second opinion, you're not sure if your planner is doing a great job or not on either retirement planning or social security planning or investments or whatever that might be, I'm happy to help with that as well, along with the social security printouts that we would do in that appointment. So again, to do that, you would just send your info to the mheatwall at the dollargroup.com um, and then we can go from there. So um, let me just take a look to see if there's any additional questions that have come in. All right, that is it on the Q&A. So I will turn this back over to Nancy.
Okay. And I'm going to stop my share here. Hi, right. Mike. Okay. Thank you, everybody, so much for um, for listening in tonight. I hope that you enjoyed listening to Mike. I know I've listened to um, this presentation many times, and I feel like, okay, I understand this. <laughs> so, um, and I kind of come in uh, for my retirement age right about the time when the benefits starting getting reduced by twenty percent. But let's hope <laughs> I'm still crossing my fingers. Yeah. But <laughs> well, that's that's better than me. I mean, who knows what it'll look like when I get there, <laughs> right. so. So um, this program is recorded, so it will be available on our website later. Uh, you can watch it um, by going to www.egvpl.org and um, it'll take you to our YouTube page where all of our programs, recorded programs are showing. It'll take, it takes a few days before it's available for you to watch, but um, it will be there. Um, I know a couple of people joined in after we got started, so I didn't get, um, the handouts to you, but I will, I can, I have your email address from the Zoom program, so I can um, email that out to you right away. Um, other than that, we will have Mike back again next year sometime. We'll figure out a date. We usually have him a couple times a year, um, but at least we'll have him at least once next year. Yes. So um, with this whole crazy uh, virtual programming thing. So <laughs> Um, but thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And if you have, um, obviously you know how to reach Mike and if you have any questions for me, um, I'm gonna quickly just type my email address here and Broughton at egbpl.org. Um, I'm kind of responsible for any of the money related programming at the library. So please feel free to email me with any questions um, or ideas and, um, Again, we thank you for your time and, and Mike, definitely thank you for your time and joining us again and You're welcome. good luck to you and everybody. So All right. see you soon. Nancy. All right. We'll say goodbye. Say goodnight. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.